Hi, and welcome to this presentation about the R package ENM eval, uh, which is one tool for evaluating ecological niche models or species distribution models. I'm Bob Muscarella, and I developed the ENM eval package with um, the people listed here on the slide. Um, before we get started, I just want to point out that this presentation is based on um, the package version 0.3.0, as you see at the bottom of the screen there. Uh, that's the current version available from CRAN. And uh, I point it out because we've been making some fairly major changes to uh, the development version of the package that we hope to release in the next coming months. So some of those changes I'll talk a little bit about towards the end of this presentation. But um, I just want to point out that when we do make the release, uh, it will be accompanied by some documentation to help you adjust to the changes. OK, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, before we move any further, I just want to point to a couple of key resources. The first is the open access paper that describes the R package, which you can um, access by this link here. Um, and there's also a link to the GitHub repository where we developed the code of ENM eval. I wanted to start with a little background to set the stage. And as you're probably aware by now, there's a large community of people for quite some time who've been using the MaxEnt program for species distribution modeling. In fact, that original paper by Phillips et al. in 2006 has been cited over 11,000 times with about more than 1,000 citations per year on average at this point. So there's a huge user base with this uh, type of software. And at least at the time when we originally developed ENM eval, most studies that were using Maxent or doing species distribution modeling at all were using those uh, software with, with the default settings. Now, the settings were selected to be defaults based on some empirical evidence, but a number of studies have shown that the default settings don't always provide the best modeling outputs. At that time there, that we were developing this, there wasn't an automated way to tune MaxSense settings. And by what I mean by tune is to explore how model performance varied um, by using different settings and then selecting settings that optimize model performance or comparing performance of models built with different settings. So that was one motivation. Another motivation for developing the package was the lack of consensus on methods and statistics that are used to evaluate SDMs. So in part, this has to do with the problem of spatial autocorrelation between the data that are used for testing and training the models. Um, in other words, the method of partitioning data for evaluation. But it also involves the fact that there are a number of different statistics used for evaluating model performance, and there's really um, little consensus about which metric to use. And in fact, different metrics tell you different things. So designing the best way to evaluate models depends on your particular data set and your research objectives. But overall, these are the circumstances under which we created ENM eval where we wanted to provide a tool for people to do this work of tuning models to facilitate selecting models based on different types of evaluation statistics. So what does ENM eval actually do? Well, in a nutshell, it does the following three things. And I'll elaborate on each of these in the next slides. First, it partitions data into a certain number of bins for model evaluation. Second, the package automatically runs the modeling algorithm on the partition data across a range of different settings. I'm focusing here and in, in this presentation on the MaxEnt algorithm and the settings that are relevant for that. Uh, I'll come back to that later, but I'll note briefly that ENM eval is increasingly flexible to be used with different modeling algorithms, um, especially in the forthcoming release. But I'll talk more about that towards the end of the presentation. And the third thing that ENM eval does is to compute a range of evaluation statistics for each of the evaluation bins. 
And the idea here is that users can then select the model settings that they want based on um, a certain evaluation metric or metrics that are most suitable for their data set and their objectives. There are a few basic requirements you need in order to use ENM eval effectively. And the first is that you need a basic understanding of R, um, especially in terms of reading and some basic manipulation of data and um, the syntax for setting different arguments for the ENM eval functions. The second uh, requirement is that you need to have a solid understanding of the mod modeling algorithm that you're using, as well as the different options for the settings and interpretation of different evaluation statistics. So all of this should really be based on thoughtful consideration of the goals and assumptions of your particular study. And third, in terms of data, what you need at the minimum are the occurrence records and environmental covariates, um, which is the same thing you would need for running Maxent by itself, for example. So now we move to this uh, schematic diagram to kind of show you the process of how ENM eval works. And we start with our point occurrence data um, up here. And the, the first thing that we do is to choose a method for partitioning the data for evaluation. Um, we typically make several data partitions or equal to this number of K. And ENM, uh, ENM eval can contain six methods for partitioning data that I'll describe now. So the first method contained within ENM eval for data partitioning is the random K fold, which is equivalent to the current implementation of data partitioning in Maxent. This method randomly splits your occurrence records into user defined K number of groups. And so if you set the number of K folds equal to one, then ENM eval will partition your data into a single test bin and a single training bin. Uh, we describe the pros and cons of each of these methods in more detail in the paper. But I'll just point out that this method in particular does not, does not protect against spatial autocorrelation between testing and training data. The second method I'll point out is called, uh, we call it the user defined method. And as the name indicates, this allows the user to directly assign occurrences and background points to different testing and training bins. So depending on how the user goes about partitioning their data, the method can reduce spatial autocorrelation between uh, testing and training data. Um, and I'll just point out here this other R package called block CV with the link below um, that could be used in conjunction with ENME Bell to partition data in advance and then evaluate the models used uh, built with those data partitions. The third method of data partitioning incorporated in the ENM eval package is called the N minus one jackknife or leave one out. And with this method, each occurrence point falls into its own bin. So we use all but one record, record for training the model in a, in a given iteration. And then we test the model with a single withheld point. And then we iterate that process for all points. So this method is really only very feasible with relatively small sample sizes. Um, and the method also does not help reduce spatial autocorrelation between testing and training data. Then we have three spatial methods of data partitioning that are designed to help, in, help reduce spatial autocorrelation between testing and training data. The first we call the block method, and uh, you can see essentially how it works in this diagram. This method will separate the points into four bins that are designed to have an equal number of records in each bin as close as possible. This method can help reduce spatial autocorrelation between testing and training, but that should be examined more explicitly by the user. This method is also likely to require extrapolation in environmental space when testing the model, which may or may not be desirable for your purposes, so something to consider. The fifth partitioning method I'll talk about is what we call the checkerboard one method, 
this separates all the records into two bins based on a checkerboard pattern. The checkerboard itself is based on the grid of the raster data used as input environmental variables, which can then be aggregated to create a checkerboard pattern of a given spatial resolution. As with the block method, this method can help reduce spatial autocorrelation between testing and training data, all this sh although this should be uh, explicitly examined. The checkerboard method is less likely uh, to require extrapolation in an environmental space than the block method, which may or may not be desirable for your study. Um, but in contrast to the block method, also the checkerboard method does not necessarily result in an even number of records in the testing and training bins. And the last partitioning method included in the package is a variation on the checkerboard such that two checkerboard patterns of different grain size are overlaid and the result is uh, partitioning of the data into four bins. So otherwise this method shares the same qualities of the first checkerboard method. So to summarize this part, ENM eval offers a set of methods to partition data for testing and training and the choice of the method should reflect the nature of the data and the objectives of the study. And again, I just point to this block CV package with, which seems like a nice tool for other options for partitioning data. So now that we have defined the bins for model evaluation, we have data split up for testing and training the model. Um, and we now run the model for each data partitioning uh, for each data partition using a range of settings defined by the user. For example, when we, when we use the Maxent algorithm, we can build models with different combinations uh, for the regularization multiplier versus, and the feature class combinations. Here again, I'll just point out that I'm focusing on the Maxent implementation, but the choice of settings to vary by the user depends on the algorithm that you are using. Um, I also point out that since um, this current version of ENM eval version 0.3.0, .0, the default algorithm is actually the MaxNet algorithm, um, while the original MaxNet Java program is also still available. The future update of ENM eval will generalize things so that you could use a broader set of modeling algorithms. So for MaxNet or MaxEnt, the key, a key setting is the regularization multiplier. This is essentially, uh, can, can be interpreted as a penalty for a model complexity where higher values impose a stronger penalty for more complex models. So in other words, higher values um, for the regularization multiplier will cause the algorithm to select for multiple, mo uh, for sim simpler models. We can choose to build models across a range of values for the regularization multiplier, and the default is from increments of 0.5 running from 0.5 to 4, but that can be set by the user. Maxent and MaxNet also use different types of feature classes um, to define the types of possible responses to the input variables. For more details on that, I strongly recommend this article by uh, Cory Miro et al. in 2013. Um, so otherwise, I'm going to assume that you're familiar with the idea of what feature classes do. But here you can choose to um, test models with different combinations of feature classes and regularization multipliers. So then you have other options that are um, you can include when using ENM eval, some of which are listed here, but others are possible. And this just depends again on which specific modeling algorithm you use. So now that we've generated our data partitions and we've chosen the combinations of model settings that we want to examine, we are now ready to actually run the models. And the magic of ENM eval is that it automates this process and it calculates a set of evaluation metrics for each iteration. 
and at the end we get our results. But um, what kind of results do we get? Well, they're holding a special type of R object called an ENM evaluation object. And this is basically a, a holder for lots of different details from our analysis. And you can see kind of what the summary of that object looks like here. Um, the results slot of the object holds a lot of the key output from the, from the analysis. And this is a data frame with all of the evaluation statistics that we can use to help identify how the model settings affected performance of our model. That's really all I'm gonna say for now about um, the detailed results that are provided by the package, but I refer you to um, the package documentation and also the vignette for, for more details on working with this output. So I'm also not going to get into the details of the different evaluation statistics that are provided by ENM eval because you can read about those um, in the paper describing the package and other papers cited here. Um, but I'll just put this table here to emphasize the fact that different metrics have different interpretations. And you should really uh, think hard to match the metric or metrics that you want to use with the objectives of your study. And I'll also quickly point out that ENM eval can also compute metrics of pairwise niche overlap in geographic space from different models as a way to quantify similarity of, of models based on different settings. You can also return the evaluation metrics for each bin of the testing and training data, as well as the average across bins, so that you can better diagnose how data partitioning affects your results. Just to show quickly an example of the type of output we can generate with ENM eval, uh, I'm just showing you a quick analysis with some um, occurrence records um, of this small tree in Puerto Rico. And I'm not going to get into the details of the data used to build these models, but just jumping straight to the output, you can see um, here we have on this left panel, I'm showing regularization multiplier on the x-axis and the delta AIC on the y-axis. And you, you can see here how um, different regularization multipliers and different feature class combinations and the co different colors affect that um, AIC value. And so you might see here that the maxent default values in this case uh, based on AIC do not represent the optimal model. Um, and then similar plots here for the omission rate um, and AUC test values. Again, for more details on the different evaluation statistics, I refer you to the original paper and other literature. But this is just to kind of show you some of the potential results for exploring how model settings affect performance. Then you, um, you can also see that the choice of settings has real consequences when we go ahead and project the models into geographic space. And here are the mapped predictions based on the settings with the lowest AIC from this example I'm showing you um, and versus the default settings um, on the right hand side. So you can see that the, the map, the projected maps look quite a bit different. So we first released ENM eval in 2014, and at this point it has been cited about 500 times. So that's, we're quite happy with the fact that it's being used, and in general it seems to have uh, been helpful to get people to stop using just the default settings without really um, doing the work to think if that's appropriate for their study. Um, but but we recently wanted to look a little bit more detail uh, about how the package has actually been used. And so we reviewed 184 papers that have cited ENM eval. About 78% of those have actually used ENM eval for part of their analysis, while about 22% just cited the work for um, the concepts but did not actually use the package. So out of this, 
the 78% of those studies that did use ENM eval for the analysis. Uh, this is showing the number of studies that have used different evaluation statistics in their in their in their work. And what you can see here is that the vast majority have selected the optimal model settings based on AIC as opposed to the other metrics that are available or combinations of different metrics. So we still have to uh, we still have some questions about using AIC in this way, which I think is covered in some of the other lectures of the course. But in any case, um, we're still working on, on summarizing the ways that ENM eval has been used so far and to build up some recommendations for how it can be used more effectively going forward. But it's just a point I want to make is to just be, um, just remember to be conscientious about your, your choice of evaluation metric really should match with um, the, the objectives of the study that you're working on. So now um, moving towards the conclusion of this presentation, I want to take a minute to point out some resources and next steps. First off, we have this vignette, which is posted online. That, gives, uh, that guides you through the process of using ENM eval from start to finish. So rather than me demonstrating something here on the video, I just point you to this uh, vignette. Um, and I really recommend going through that if you, if you wanna learn more details about how to use the package and the different options and different results. Uh, next, I'll just mention really quick that a new version, version 1.0.0, is slated for release in the coming months. We've been working a lot on this, especially Jamie Cass, and um, this is a major update for the package that will include some big changes, including more flexibility for using a wider range of modeling algorithms. So you should stay tuned for more information on that. But I'll note that some of the changes are fundamental enough that they will require updates to your code if, you're, if you have code that was written from a previous version of the package. The changes will all be documented thoroughly, so hopefully this won't be um, too painful of a process, but you just have to stay tuned with the updates as they come along. So I'll conclude with these, uh, by showing these links to additional resources some of which I have already mentioned. Um, but overall, I hope that you find the EML, ENM eval package um, useful for your work. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the course and um, good luck with everything. So thanks.